Well, greetings, friends. It's good to be with you once again on our Wednesday night Bible classes. And uh, we just welcome you with us at this time. We're dealing in these sessions on the Feast of the Lord. And what we've been talking about is the Feast of Atonement. And we'll continue to look at that today as the Lord gives us His grace and direction to do so. Um, in Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Beginning with verse 24 through verse 28. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet should he offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Uh, this is the work of our high priest. And I want us to look at verse 24. We've dealt with verse 26. Once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Verse 24 is dealing with the reality now to appear in the presence of God for us. And I want to just start that today because there's a number of things in verse 24, in my opinion, that we need to look at. Uh, looking at these words these three words in these three verses, now to appear, now to appear. And to them who look for him shall he appear. But here in verse 24, we have Christ appearing in the heaven, in the heaven not as it was in the types and shadows in the Old Testament and with the Old Testament priesthood, even the Old Testament high priest. Everything there was a type, a shadow. In fact, it was a promise and a prophecy that has now come to be fulfilled in Christ. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. It is not a ceremony to be done again and again and again, but it is the end. The end of that ceremony, the end of the world, the end of the first. In Hebrews 10, we have read several times concerning Christ and the volume of the book. Then said he in Hebrews 10 verse 9, 
will I come to do, well, uh, let me start in verse 7. In, bur or in verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So we have in Hebrews a completed work, a work that was, as I say again, given of God in the various feasts of Israel, first in the feast of Passover, which is a type and a shadow of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ himself. And then in the feast of Pentecost, which points to uh, the fulfillment of his coming again, as he promised he would. And in John 14, there is something said that I want us to look at in reference to verse 24 here, uh, John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, because all of this was spoken of Christ, speaking to his disciples concerning their future union with him, future only by a few days, even after he was speaking to them, as it is recorded here in John 14. And it's interesting here that he starts out with a view of what we're going to at least begin to talk about in verse 24. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. It's a better translation. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. The indication there is that my Father's house is a large dwelling place, room for all. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. The place that he prepares is in himself. And that's something we want to look at in a while. The place that he prepares through his death, his burial, his resurrection, which is what these verses are talking about. It's what he's talking about here. He's not going someplace and then comes back in several thousand years. Uh, he is going someplace and in three days he will return. And again, when he talked to the Jews concerning the destruction of the temple in Matthew and throughout uh, his, but particularly there uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, also in, in John's uh, Gospel, it's interesting that he, in talking to them about the temple, told them that it would be three days destroy destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again and this he is speaking of his body the church his body the church and and here he is primarily speaking of the same thing 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now this is the same three days. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. Verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in verse 20, well, verse 19, And yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And at that day, and again, he's speaking of the day of which he is speaking here. A little while, you see me no more, you, uh, the world seeth me no more, but you shall see me. And this is speaking, of course, of his resurrection, and I live, you shall live also. And at that day, the day of that, the day of that coming, and I said in three days, well, he came forth in the resurrection in three days, he came again, he came again, uh, on Pentecost. He came and he stayed for 40 days with the disciples and yet he was still without them showing to them that he was resurrected from among the dead yet not dwelling in them. And he kept them with him for 40 days and then told them to go and wait for 10 days and on the day of Pentecost when that day was fully come and the fully fullness of the coming of the day of Pentecost is found to be Christ himself because the day of Pentecost had come again and again and again and again and again. So had Passover, so had tabernacles, all again and again and again. But Christ came once to bring all of that to an end and to bring it into the reality of Him. Self, to do away with the first and to establish the second. We've said that it is out from the second, as the second, as the very substance of the second, as the fulfillment of the promise of the new, the second, that he appears to those who are in him and who, in whom he dwells, who look for him, showing them salvation without sin. And we see that in the type and shadow of the high priest. And we've dealt with that several times. They waited for him to appear and he showed himself to them. And we've, we've looked at all of that. But here we're looking at something else that Israel never experienced except in promise. And that's in this verse 24. But here in John 14, when he's talking about all of this that we will be looking at in a moment, he starts out talking about that in my Father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And in verse 20, he says, In that day you shall know that I'm in my Father, you in me, and I in you. Now that's what we want to look at, and we will probably be several sessions doing it, but I want us to look at it in Hebrews 9.24, we'll begin here. Christ has not entered into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now we've talked about this. We have Christ appearing for us in the presence of God. And as I've said, we'll continue to spend some time with this. But let me just focus on something that we've talked about before and bring that back to our, uh, to our consideration. The word for here does not mean instead of. It means in behalf of or for the sake of. In fact, uh, in this place, it's the only, uh, when the word for is used, uh, where it is actually not 
translated as uh, on behalf of. Um, and it, because the word hooper always means, H-U-P-E-R, always means in behalf of. So here we have Christ, just looking at this as an overview. Here we have Christ appearing before his Father as the all and in all of his body. His body, the church. Those who live in and by him. It's the head appearing on behalf of his body, not separate from the body, not without the body. Remember what we just read, not separate from the body, not the body in one place, him in another, not out of the body, and not without the body, but, and not instead of the body but on behalf of the body, for sake of the body. Here we have Christ, the firstborn of many brethren, appearing as the covering, the salvation, the life, the righteousness of all who have died with him and now live in and by him who liveth, of course, in us. And here we have Christ presenting the body, his body, that he has redeemed those who are in him, those who are in him, presenting that body in himself. And again, it goes back to John uh, uh, 14, and also in John 17, verse 24, where Jesus says, Father, I desire that, though, that they also whom thou gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. And we'll be talking about this in time to come, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. Now, where does that become a reality with reference to the cross and with reference to the finished work of the cross? Because you need to remember that the finished work of the cross is true, might I say it this way, to both sides of the cross to that which is before the cross and to that which remains. The finished work is true to both the first and the second. One is fully brought to Christ as the end of it, the end of it in, 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 in several definitions of the word end, but it is brought to him in his death. And the other that, that comes forth in his resurrection, he is also the very end, that is the very finish, the very completeness, the very all and in all of the second. And it is out from that, out of the midst of the second, so to speak, that he appears. For it is in him that we see the reality of the second, the second man, the Lord from heaven. On and on we could go with that, and I think probably we already have. But here we have Christ appearing before his Father as the all and in all of those who live in and by him. It's the head appearing on behalf of his body and yet not without his body. We have the firstborn among many brethren appearing as the covering, which we'll talk about later, the salvation, the life, the righteousness of all who have died with him and now live in and by him. 
Where does this all come to be a reality? In the death? In the burial? No. In the resurrection. Of which Christ says, as I've already spoken, I am in the Father. He speaks this of the resurrected Son. I am in the Father. You are in me. And I am in you. And we'll look at Paul's comments on this as we go along here for a little while. This is Jesus bringing, well, you and I, who are his body, back to glory. Not that we've ever been there, but that's where he came from in the first place. And as the word of God goes forth and does not return void, so it is Christ presenting to the Father. I'm in the Father, you are in me. And we'll look at that in the, in the sense that you are hidden in me and I am in you. So it's Jesus bringing back to the glory that he left behind a body clothed in him, covered in him, filled with him, presenting himself on our behalf in the presence of God as the fulfillment of the high priest. It's the exact same thing that Paul was talking about in Colossians 3. And I'd like for us to look at that just for a moment. And we'll look at several other verses, which is primarily the purpose of this session. And then we'll go into those verses as the Lord directs. But in Colossians 3, look at what Paul says. If ye then be risen with Christ. And we can read it this way because this is the way it is actually translated. Since then. Since then. Uh, And this points here to Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Hon, in him you find the very end of your salvation. The very end of salvation. You are complete in Him. Which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen the King James says with him the original says you are risen through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him up from among the dead. And then in verse in chapter 3, based upon what he is saying here, if then, since then, ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, which all of this we'll look at as we go along in, a, in sessions ahead. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And not only that, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him 
in glory. And all of this is talking about what we have just looked at and have been looking at in Hebrews 9 and 10, and that which we're still considering. And we will consider these verses in the light of what we're talking about in Hebrews 9 and 10. But I want you to know that these are joined together because it is what Paul is talking about and the same thing that the Hebrew writer is talking about here as well as some other places we'll look at that Paul is certainly talking about. We have one son here in Hebrews returning to the glory of his father. Uh, we might want to look at something. I'm not for sure I've got that in these notes. Uh, let's look at John 17. I'll give you enough that you can spend some time looking at this because we'll come back to it uh, as much as we can. John 17. John 17. A lot of misunderstanding in John 17. But we'll look just for a moment. I quoted you one verse out of it a while ago, but just for a moment. Beginning with verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. Father, the hour is come. What is he speaking of there? In John 12. In John 12, verse 27. Now is my heart troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there or came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people, therefore, that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and die, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And this he said, signifying, signifying what death he should die. And he is speaking of that same thing here. Father, the hour is come. Because in John 12, he says the same thing. The hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, even Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And that's what we've been talking about. When I said Jesus is bringing back to the glory he left behind, his body clothed in him, covered in him, filled with him, and presenting himself on our behalf in the presence of God. Now, 
Let me, let me continue. And I'm going to just skip over here a little ways. All right. <clears throat> we have one son resurrected, and in him we live and move and have our being. And then that one son, together with his body, returns to his father bringing us with him to glory. It's this same son now presenting himself on our behalf before the Father as the consummation of the eternal plan of salvation, or we could say the eternal plan of God, presenting himself, presenting himself. And one of our problems in church entity and in man's definition of the scripture is that this verse and others like it most that I just read to you, is understood to be either a future event or something that waits the death of our physical body. And the resurrection that we're looking for in most cases in Christianity, if you've ever been to a funeral, you certainly know this, is the resurrection of our physical bodies. While we're talking about the resurrection and the life living in his body and his body living in him. We're talking about the resurrection of the body of Christ. And Paul is speaking of this same resurrection, this same resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, all the way through it. He's talking about this same resurrection. And what is this, hon, except our salvation? We're talking about here our salvation. That salvation which is by his death, that bringing to an end, that bringing to death, that doing away with the first, that he may bring forth in himself and establish in himself the second, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Even his body, even his body, which is in fact the body of his resurrection. So this is, this is, what, we're, this is what we're talking about here. And the tragedy, I say again, is that it's all pointing in many, many cases by misunderstanding, mistranslation, uh, or rather misinterpretation, and probably mistranslation too, but certainly misinterpretation of what the Hebrew writer is saying. But the Hebrew writer and Paul himself and, and, and Jesus himself was not talking about some event far away. He wasn't talking about bringing the natural planet, the natural earth, to an end. And when I say natural, I mean this that you can see uh, out your window, uh, the destruction of a planet. He, he's talking about the old economy of Judaism, the old economy under the law, He's talking about everything that goes all the way back to Adam in the garden is all gathered into himself in the cross and brought to its end. Brought to its absolute end that he may bring forth the new in himself. And as one new man live in that new life 
creation, that new heaven and earth, that new temple, that new city, that new body. This is what we're talking about here. This is what we're considering. And this is what Paul means when he said in Colossians that we just read, since then you are risen with Christ. But you see, hon, we have different visualizations of that, and we don't need a visualization of it, of our natural mind. We need an understanding of it given of God by His Spirit. Uh, let's look at Ephesians 1, because all of this is the same. This is the same. In Ephesians chapter 1, uh, actually this goes over into Ephesians uh, chapter 2. And we'll spend our time just now in Ephesians chapter 2 rather than taking all of the time going through from verse 1. But actually what Paul is saying in verse 1, he shows to be fulfilled in chapter 2. Does he not? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Well, chapter 2. He brings chapter 1 to a fulfillment here. Uh, I say a fulfillment. He brings it at least to a, uh, to a point. In verse 21, verse 20 and 21, which he wrought in Christ, which he wrought in Christ. Now, hon... If God had simply, and it's, it's not a simple thing, but if he had simply raised up his son out from among the dead and had seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and might and power and all of that, And yet, not brought us into a union with that same Jesus. Then what good would it have done you and I? If he is one place and we are in another waiting for him to come and get us and take us to some place, what, what good was that to those believers 2,000 years ago and in fact to believers today? If Christ resurrected never lives in the believer, then where is our salvation? Now some would say, well, you know, it's, it's he forgive us of our sins. But you see, even the feasts of the Lord, the testimony of the feast of the Lord given to Israel goes far beyond that. 
This, this day of atonement that we've been talking about goes far beyond that. This day of reconciliation, which is what that day is, the great day of reconciliation by the blood. But then, hon, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with death, 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 though that death is certainly sure. We've read that in these sessions in Romans 5, how sure that it is. But then in Romans 6, Paul brings you and I right into union with Christ through that death. What? Know you not? That as many of us as were baptized into Christ are baptized into his death, buried with him by baptism into death. Why? So that, so that, not only would we be partakers of him in his death and in his burial, but partakers of him in his resurrection, in that the resurrected one lives in you. Now, that's all in Romans 6, but it's the same Paul, it's the same teaching. And so here in, 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 in Ephesians, he is speaking of Christ, no doubt about that. Far above all principality, verse 21, might, dominion, every name that is named. Not only in that world, of sight and sound, the natural world, but in that which was prophesied to come and is now come in Christ, is now come in Christ. I've been reading the last part of, well, I've been reading today from Isaiah chapter 45 through chapter 66, actually, and you find the promise given of everything there that Christ comes and fulfills in himself regarding actually what we're sitting here talking about right now, a new heaven, a new earth, Christ in you. For none of that was ultimately fulfilled in either the captivity of Babylon or the coming out of Babylon, but rather fulfilled through Christ and the cross. Not that Christ and the cross are two separate things, but through Christ crucified. Now resurrected, here in the scripture declares, now resurrected, and Paul goes on to say, now living in you. Look at what he says. Hath put all things under his feet and gave him, gave him, the words to be should not be there, gave him the head of all things to the church. Now we're talking about Christ in you, and you in Christ, in union with Christ. But I love the word in, and we'll look at that as we go along, because that's where we're hidden. Hidden with Him, in Him, in God. And there, the only life that is revealed, the only life that appears, is Christ himself. And in that appearing, we are not only, we, well, in that appearing, we see that we are with him who is in us. The reality of that, and I, and I don't want to get into that, I'm jumping way ahead of myself, but hun, the cross was not just about the taking away of the first and the establishing of the second. See, the taking away of the first 
had to do with an old man, had to do with Adam, had to do with old covenant Israel, had to do, I guess what I'm trying to say is people. The second does also, but not as a Jew and a Gentile simply forgiven. Not as a rich or poor, a male or female, a bond or free, simply set free. But rather, a reality of union with Christ wherein there is no Jew or Gentile, wherein nothing of the old exists, but rather where Christ is the all and in all. He is the new that is come. The new creation, the new man, the true righteousness of God. We receive that by supernatural work of God. If you have ever thought of your being born again as supernatural, if you haven't, you need to think of it that way because the very spirit of the eternal Son of God Himself coming to dwell in you, hon, is a very supernatural thing. We're talking about our being joined unto Him. Look at this. Verse 23, which is His body, the fullness of Him, Him who? Him that, or Him who, filleth in that body all and in all. How do we come to such a union with Him? Chapter 2. Chapter 2. And you, again the words hath He quickened, and we'll leave them there. They're in italics. You who were dead in trespasses and sin. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's listed as something that he is exalted far above and has power over. That you walk that way. the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, Paul speaking of himself, had our manner of life in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And hon, Paul has to be talking of himself here, who was a Jew all of his life. And not only that, a Pharisee of the Pharisees all of his life. And not only that, he ended up trying to find his righteousness and his life in the law and ended up saying, my God, I'm nothing but a wretched man. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Among whom we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith, wherewith He loved us. And we know that to be the very work of the cross. The very work of the cross. Who is the work of the cross? It is Christ Himself who is the very foundation of our salvation and of all that we are 
come to be in Him. And what have we come to be in Him? His body. And we're that through the power of His resurrection. We're not resurrected aside from Him, but by the one who now lives in us. And yet where He is, we are also. In union with Him. In union with Him. Rich in His mercy, for with He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. Now here is what I'm talking about in verse 24. Hath quickened us together with Christ. Not as Christ. Not as Christ. We are not Christ. Our union is inseparable from Christ because our union with the Father is Christ. You understand that? But that doesn't make me Christ, doesn't make you Christ, and that isn't what we're saying here. We are that one body of Christ. John 17 is saying the same thing as Paul is saying in this one verse. I mean, he pretty well summed up John 17 right here in this verse. And I haven't seen too many who recognize that. There are some who do, but not many who recognize that summation. But you'll find it in John 17, hon, because it's not talking about us becoming one with God. It isn't talking about us becoming even one with Christ. It's talking about us becoming the one body of Christ, one with one another. He hath quickened us together. Together as one body. There's no way you and I are quickened together or any other way except by Christ. We're certainly not quickened there in the flesh. In the flesh, I'm one thing, you're another thing. And we'll always be that way as long as this mortal body exists. I will always be a man, a man will always be a man, a woman will always be a woman. I know, I know we have a society that's dead bent on trying to change that, but just forget it. Just forget it. A Jew will always be a Jew, a Gentile will always be a Gentile, right on down the line. We can crossbreed, we can do whatever we want to do, we're still humanity, except by the cross. The quickening, the quickening, the quickening. When are we quickened? When the life given, quickening, eternal spirit himself comes into us. We are quickened. But it doesn't, just make a, it doesn't just make a quickened individual with me. And many people think that. They think, I'm an individual, I'm quickened together with Christ. I'm an individual quickened together with Christ. That means I'm Christ. No, it doesn't. Quickened together. Quickened as one. What? Body. What's he talking about here? What has he been talking about here? In the sentences just above. Him having headship over His body, the church. Not just having headship, but actually being the head by whom every joint is fitly framed together. There isn't any other way you're going to be fitly framed together. You can't do that by, well, even religious beliefs or in any other way. Not really, honey, because the building is not of man. The building is of God, and God who builds the building is greater than the building itself. Quickened together. 
Not only that, not only that, raised that one body. He quickened us. By grace you are saved. One body. Then raised as one body. And made us the word us is not really there, is it? And made to set as one body. Now, I'm tell you right now, that's not an earthly view of things, is it? It's a shame. Because it should be. It should be. What we are in Christ should be made evident in earth. Should be made evident in earth. Why is the earth so big and mean and bad? I mean, Israel made that mistake. We can't go over there. Well, you're right. Not in and of yourselves, you can't. But the type and shadow there was never of them doing it in and of themselves anyway. Not even under the law. Was that the type and shadow? Certainly wasn't the intent that was set forth in the law, was it? No. But thank God Christ in you is more than an intent. He's the fulfillment of the intent. The intent of the law, the intent of the promise, the intent of the prophecies, the intent of the, of the whole ball game of the type and shadow and testimony and prophecy, Christ is the fulfillment of it. And here we're reading about union with Him. Quickened us together. Our union is in Him. Through the reality that it is He who lives in us and nobody else. Now, I've harped and harped and harped and harped on that, on these very verses, and I haven't quit yet in other classes. The end has come. The end has come. The end of the first is the end of the second. I mean, you're not going to be one thing in the first, and then all of a sudden you get all of your identity back, and all of your individualism back, and all of this back, and there you are in the second. No, you see, that's not... your. That's not, where, that's not how it works. There he is in the second. Lord, I want to get to this business on we are hidden in him. The divine covering of God. Hallelujah. The covering of God. That we may stand in his presence. How do we do that? Because we are in his presence by being in Christ, who is the very manifest glory and person of the presence of God. Now, now most believers do not understand that. They're not, they're not even taught that so that they might turn their hearts to understand that. But it's the truth nonetheless, and we're, we're not even started to be through looking at verse 24 here to gather this up in this reality. Seated in heaven, in Christ Jesus. And so we're back to our beginning. In verse 24, he has entered into heaven itself. Into heaven itself. Now to appear. I do indeed love that word because our salvation is not a theology about it. It is the appearing of it. 
Hallelujah. Christ, the very person of our salvation lives in you. It's not, we, we may have doctrines, some of our doctrines may even be true. I trust that they all would be. But our salvation is a person, huh? Who actually appears. Who actually appears. Who actually is made known. We need to get a hold of that because it is in Him that we are made known. And yet it is always not I but Christ. You see, hon, He brings many sons unto glory, but it is not the many that appear. It is the one who appears in the many. And on behalf of the many before the Father. What a salvation we have. What a salvation. And I knew that when we dealt with this, we were going to go far beyond reconciliation and we were going to have to go right into saved, that is made whole, made complete, Romans 5, by His life, by His living in us. Now, hun, if Christ is one place and I'm another, then how is He living in me? So, we'll continue. Time is up. We'll continue looking at verse 24. Obviously, we'll be looking at that reality in many verses. And I trust that even as we have turned our heart to receive Him, we will turn our heart by that same Spirit to know Him. May the Lord bless and look forward to chatting with you again from time to time. Thank you for being with us in our Wednesday night classes and uh, may the Lord richly bless you and may May, may His presence come to abound in you and I through an acknowledgement, through an acknowledgement of Him who is in you and in me. Appreciate hearing from you folks. Please don't hesitate to let us know if you have questions or well, anything you want to talk to us about. I also appreciate you who take the time to uh, help support this that we are doing here in this place. And that is seeking to present this gospel, which is Christ, throughout His body and around the world. And it's with your helpful support that we're able to do that, going beyond maintaining the status quo, reaching out throughout His whole body around the world. Thank you so much for that. Amen. The Lord bless.